And good morning. Welcome to Woodward Park Baptist Church. It is wonderful to see everyone in, in, just encouraging one another and fellowship, fel, fellowshipping, but we're going to get started. So go ahead and find your seats. We are glad that you're here today, the first day of the week. What, what, by the time that, that John wrote Revelation, he called it the Lord's Day, right? This is the Lord's Day. This is the first day of the week, the day we celebrate and worship Jesus Christ, the risen Savior who rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death on our behalf on the first day of the week. And so we worship him today on his day, the Lord's Day. And if you are a guest with us this morning, I want to give you a special welcome. If whether you're here in person or you're joining us online, we are so glad that you are our guest this morning. And we would love to know more about you and, and your visit here. And so we have these connection cards by the door, and we'd love to, to just to know more about you and your visit. If you'd fill one of those out for us. And we also have a special gift for you at the Welcome Center. And, and, and just for our normal church members, just remember that you can put your prayer requests on these cards, and our staff prays for you, uh, prays for those weekly. We have a couple important announcements for everyone this morning. The first one is that the, the tickets are on sale for the women's luncheon. So, so ladies, if you've not signed up for the women's luncheon, make sure you come over to the table here after service and sign up for the women's luncheon. Uh, another announcement uh, is coming up is the church is going to have our bit church business meeting and potluck on Sunday, October 24th, and that's going to be at 6 p.m., and so we'll worship here that morning and then go home and then come back at 6 p.m. And we'll do our, our, our business as a family, but also have another wonderful time of fellowship over dinner that evening. And men, we want you to save the date. We don't have tickets. We don't have flyers yet, but we want you to put, your, put this on your calendar. In fact, gentlemen, go ahead and get your phones out. Get your phone. I don't see any phones getting out. Get your phones out and save the date, yes, even during church, uh, for November 6th. November 6th at 8 a.m. is going to be our men's breakfast. You don't want to miss this one. Jacob Zillion, who's the pastor of Set Free Sanger, is going to come and share. Uh, he is an amazing brother in the Lord, incredibly encouraging, loves the word, powerful testimony. It's going to be a wonderful time. So brothers, Please save the date, plan on being here November 6th, Saturday at 8 a.m. to hear Jacob Zillian come and share with us at the men's breakfast. Our last announcement, on your seats, you should have these little prayer cards, and it's a reminder that we are starting to, to be our, our Operation Christmas Child. And so you can please start praying, and here's some ways you can be praying for Operation Christmas Child. And we're going to have the boxes available over here uh, after service. And, and the, the Operation Christmas Child team is going to be able to answer any of your questions. And in fact, we have a little video for you to share with you about what we're doing here. The joy of seeing a child open the boxes for the first time is just, it's incredible. There's squeals and screams, and they're so excited to see what's inside their box. Oh, my goodness! Every shoebox gift represents the love of God to them. We are so excited. Many of the children receive the shoebox for the first time in their life. What a great gift. I get a present. I get to know who Jesus is, but not only that, I get to be discipled in his way. After these children open the box, they have the opportunity to go through the greatest journey, the 12 lesson discipleship program, where they get to learn more about Jesus Christ. This shoe box gives us an opportunity to continue to shine the bright light of the gospel in the darkest and remote places around the world. We're seeing families come to know Jesus. Churches are sprouting up in these communities. These children are rising up to be disciples in their own country. The gift box and the gospel of Jesus Christ bring hope to our children to bring the smiles back on their faces. I'm just so amazed at what God does each and every year. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of millions of children, just like you've seen. Every box is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you, and God bless each and every one.
And of course, why wouldn't we want to participate with this, right? And making an impact for God's kingdom around the world just, just from here, from Fresno. So come, come pick up a box, ask your questions, and, and come get involved in, in what God's doing through this. But let me call us to worship here. I want to call us to worship from what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul writes this. He says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or imagine, that that is true. We celebrate, and that is what you have done to bring us from death to life, through, through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And so now, Lord, we as your followers, we would worship you for you deserve all glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, church, would you stand with us as we worship this morning? We're going to sing and plead to God to build his kingdom here. One, two, three, four.
Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 136, and I invite you to open your Bibles to that psalm. And this is a unique psalm in that every verse ends the exact same way. It earns with, ends with the phrase, for his steadfast love endures forever. And what the psalmist does is he recounts really the history of Israel and God's steadfast love to the nation. We're not going to read all um, 26 of the verses this morning, but we're going to look at verses 1 through 9 and then 23 through 26. And I'm going to read the first part of the verse, and then I'd like you to respond with, for his steadfast love endures forever. The ESV translates that, his steadfast love. Other translations may be his loving kindness, but they all point to the fact that God is loyal, that he's steadfast, that he's faithful, that he is true in his love for his people. So as we read this, have that in mind. I'll read the first part and then ask you to respond with, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights, his steadfast love endures forever. the sun to rule over the day, his steadfast love forever. the moon and stars to rule over the night. His steadfast love forever. Then verse 23, it is he who remembered us in our low estate his steadfast love forever. and rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning and praise you because you are the God of gods, the Lord of lords. God, we thank you that we don't know you as a God that is far off, but we know you personally. We know that you are our Lord God, that you are Yahweh. And God, we thank you for that relationship, Lord. And God, we thank you for your steadfast love, that your love is trustworthy, that your love is faithful, that your love never fails, that, Lord, you are steadfast even when we are not. God, that you demonstrate loving kindness even when we don't. And so, God, we, we praise you and thank you that you are an awesome and amazing God. And God, we thank you for the wonders that you do on earth, Lord. We thank you for the wonder of creation, Lord, that the sun rises every morning, God, that the stars are there, that you created all of them with your hand. And God, that no matter what chaos is going on on earth, Lord, around us and things can seem so arbitrary, Lord, God, we know that you are in charge. And the creation around us points us to your steadfast love. God, we thank you that you cause the rain to fall on the good and the unjust. Lord, that in your grace and your patience, you continue to allow people to have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Lord, we pray that your word would go out, that the gospel would go out, Lord, that it would be preached in churches around the world, Lord. God, we pray that it would be preached in our country, Lord, and we pray that you would have it preached in our city. And Lord, we thank you because we know that that is happening faithfully around the world. And we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, Lord, across our country and in our city. Lord, specifically, I pray for Sean Henderson this morning, the pastor at Sierra View Presbyterian Church, Lord. And God, I know he loves you and he preaches the gospel faithfully, Lord. And I pray that you would strengthen and encourage him, Lord. God, we pray that you would use him to draw people to you. God, that that church would grow in faithfulness. God, we pray that you would revive our city, our country, and Lord, this earth. God, that people would come to you in faith. 
God, we pray this morning for Mark and Hannah Bustrom in Portugal, Lord, as they share the gospel there and as you're growing a church there, Lord. And we thank you for the church that uh, they planted, God, and, and that is supposed to be independent of the planting church here in the next few months, God. We pray that you would continue to grow and bless them, Lord, in a country that is less than 1% evangelical Christians, Lord. God, we pray that the gospel would go out and that you would use Mark and Hannah Bustrom to do that, Lord. God, we pray for uh, Gina Kismet, the principal at Maple Creek Elementary across the street, Lord. God, we pray you would give her wisdom as she leads in that school, Lord. God, we pray that the Good News Club that meets here at our church, that ladies from this church are putting on on Wednesdays, Lord, that that would be used and the gospel would spread across that school. God, we again just pray that you would, in your steadfast love, continue to save souls. And Lord, as we begin the Operation Christmas Child season, Lord, we pray that we as families would have fun filling the boxes, Lord, that it would be good family time. But Lord, we pray ultimately that these boxes would be used as a tool to share the gospel wherever they go. And again, Lord, that people would turn to you, that they would repent of their sin and come to you in faith. God, we know you are a God full of steadfast love. God, that you are faithful and true. And Lord, we pray that just more people would know that. And Lord, as we continue to worship God, we pray you would remind us of your faithfulness, of your steadfast love. And God, as we give this offering, we pray that it would be used with wisdom. Lord, that it would be used with grace. And then it would be used to show your steadfast love. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in love. You guys stand with us as we continue worshiping. We're going to sing a uh, modern uh, rendition of All Creatures of Our God and King. Here we go. Three, two, three, four.
actually introduced to you last week, so please join us as we sing about Christ, our hope in life and death. our hope. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days within His hand? What apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love 
Open your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 3 this morning. Um, it seems that whenever good things come along, there's somebody there to, to twist them and um, turn them for evil. Um, the internet was a fabulous thing, is a fabulous thing, but yet it has been twisted and used for so much evil. Um, VCRs were great. I remember um, complaining to my parents that we were the only family in America that didn't have a VCR, and uh, finally they, they got one, but ultimately those are twisted and used for, for evil as well. And then we, we sing that song, Christ Our Hope in Life and Death, and it reminds me of, of what we're going to talk about today as, as Peter starts to, to warn the church that false teachers are, are going to come. And the gospel, the good news of the gospel is that God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for sinners who had been separated from Him, who are separated from Him because of their sin. And God sent Jesus to die on the cross, and, and all He asks is that we repent, that we turn from sin, that we grab a hold of Him as our only hope in life and death. And that is such good news, and it's so simple. But yet so many people twist it and turn it into something that it's not. And as Peter continues in this letter in, in 2 Peter, that's what he gets to today. The fact that, that false prophets and false teachers will arise. And so we're going to look at just verses 1 through 3 uh, this morning and then look at the rest of the chapter next week. But he spends all of chapter 2 talking about false teachers and warning about them. So if you would, look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and look at verses 1 through 3 with me. Peter writes, But pro false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of the way of the truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. This is God's perfect, holy, and infallible word for us this morning. Let's pray. God, we pray that as, you, as we look at this, Lord, that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would strengthen our resolve, that you would strengthen our faith in you. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. So let's start first with the history of false teachers. The history of of false teachers. Uh, the verse 1 begins with the word but, and if you've been coming to advance, you know that that is a transitional word, right? And we need to pay attention to that. Um, and it's, it's tying us to the paragraph that was before. And Peter has been talking about, uh, in the paragraph before, he's talking about the, the majesty of Christ. Remember in verse 16, he says, we didn't bring cleverly devised myths. We brought to you the truth of Jesus Christ, and he goes back and he reminds them of Jesus' majesty that was on display at the Mount of Transfiguration. And then he reminds them that there's something better than that, what they experienced on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's the prophetic word, it's scripture, it's that God has revealed himself, he's written it down, so we're not reliant on our own memory. And he says, We, we have this prophetic word. And it's more fully confirmed. He says, you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. He says, that's what we're going to hold to. And so he's pointing to the glory of Christ and the glory of Scripture and reminds them in verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So we have this awesome word. We have God's word to us directly. And that's, that's good news, right? That is an amazing thing that God has spoken, that we know what He wants, what He desires, we know how to be saved. And then what's the very next word? But. But false prophets also arose among the people. And so he's, he's looking back and he's saying, you know what? Those people that were living in the Old Testament, they had God speaking to them at the mountain. They had prophets that spoke for God. But false prophets arose. There's always false prophets. There are always prophets that will come 
and take what is good and twist it and pervert it and lie about it. False prophets will always rise up. They've always been around. Who was the first false prophet? Satan, right? Imagine living in the garden. Everything's good. You're walking with God every day, and then here comes this person, this serpent, to twist it, to twist what God had told them, to twist what they were hoping in, to tell them that there is something better outside of what God has promised, and he twists it. And if you look at Jeremiah 23, let me read from there as Jeremiah talks about the false prophets that were around in his day and they're throughout the Old Testament. I just chose to pick one uh, passage rather than walk through all of them in the Old Testament, but there are all of these warnings. This is what Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 23, 9. He says, concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me, all my bones shake I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers because of the curse the land mourns, and the pastures of the wilderness are dried up. Their course is evil and their might is not right. Both both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their evil, declares the Lord. Therefore their way shall be be to them like slippery paths in the darkness into which they shall be driven and fall for I will bring disaster upon them in the year of punishment declares the Lord if the pro- in the prophets of samaria i saw an unsavory thing they prophesied by baal and led my people israel astray but in the prophets of jerusalem i have seen a horrible thing they commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore says the Lord of the hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with bitter food and give them poisoned water to drink. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has gone out into all the land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be with you, and to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word, or who has paid attention to his word and listened? So you you read that and you think, well, of you look up there at verse 16, well, of course the prophets of Baal are going to preach against God. But then he says in the very next verse, but the prophets in Jerusalem, I've seen a horrible thing. The prophets in Jerusalem are the ones that should know, right? They're the ones that should know who God is. They're the ones that should remember God's steadfast love, how he rescued them out of Egypt by his mighty hound, how he took them into the wilderness, how he spoke to them in a way that no nation had ever been spoken to before because there's no other God that speaks. They should know better, but yet false prophets arise and they do these horrible things and God, you see God's reaction to it. False prophets have always been around. They will always be around. And that's the history of false prophets. Next, we want to see the reality of false prophets teachers or false prophets and that's just in the second part of the verse there he says but false prophets also arose among the people so i want you to see false prophets rose back then and then he says but just as there will be false teachers among you and so when we think about false teachers and false prophets we're not talking just about something that happened long ago we're talking about something that can happen today something that can happen in churches and does happen in churches you can read books by false prophets false teachers. You can watch them on TV. You can go and hear them. This was not just an Old Testament problem. In Matthew 7, 15, Jesus warns the people of false prophets. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And I just want you to keep that picture, ravenous wolves, ones that would come to to devour, to destroy, who care only about their own passion their own instinct. That's what they run on. Why are there always false prophets? Why have there always been false prophets? 
I think it goes back to chapter 1, verse 19, where it says that Peter says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. You see, the gospel, God, scripture, is, it's a lamp shining into a dark world. It's light, but people don't like light. They don't like light. Look over at John chapter 3. Actually, don't go there yet. Um, most people love the darkness. John 3, 19 says this, This is the judgment that light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. People love the darkness because their deeds are evil. And when the gospel come and light shines, there's a tendency to, to want to block the light, to diffuse the light. Have you ever walked into the room and somebody's asleep and flipped on the light? I know you're all sinners like me, so you've done that, right? And there's, there's a perverse joy in watching. What do they do? They cower. They, they pull the covers up over their heads. They, they, cover, they want to hide from the light. They cover their face. They may throw things at you, yell at you, but they want to do whatever. They, just stop the light. Turn out the light. Let me go back to sleeping in my warm, comfortable bed. And unfortunately, that's where a, a majority of the world is. And when light shines into a dark place, there are those that will come to twist it, to turn it for their own, um, for their own purposes or just to stop it. So they attempt to hide from the light. One way to hide from the light is to tell yourself it's not real, to say that it's something else, to draw others away from the light to your way of thinking so you feel justified in what you do. We as Christians must guard the light. We have to guard the gospel. We have to guard God's truth and recognize that false teachers are still around. Just because something is in a Christian bookstore or somebody that's a Christian hands you a book, do not assume that it's good. How, how do you determine what's good? You go back to Scripture, right? Does it, does it match this? And if you ever come across something and you're like, that just seems a little weird, go check. Because if you've been walking with the Lord and the Holy Spirit's working in your life, the more time you spend in this, the more time you will recognize what is weird. The more time you spend here, the more God will work. So, so know that they're around. Well, what are the meth what's the method of false teachers? What's the method? He says there, um, the false teachers are among you, and then he says this, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Peter is warning the church. How, how do false teachers get into the church? They don't usually come in with, with trumpets and announce, say, hey, I'm a false teacher. It, it, it sneaks in. It, it crawls in. The idea is to bring something in from the outside. It's the idea of smuggling something in. If you've ever, um, I remember as a child reading, reading these books, um, I, it was Ivan, I don't remember the whole title, but it was about um, sneaking Bibles in, into Russia, into the Soviet Union, and what they would do to, to sneak these Bibles in, to smuggle them in. And that's really the idea here, is that false teaching is being smuggled in, it's being snuck in. And the church is usually attacked in small conversations, in small teachers here and there, and smuggling new ideas in. Some people building a coalition and, and gaining their own followers and gaining people to follow them. Well, what kind of destructive heresies were around back then? And I'm going to give you two, but I think that we have our own versions today of these. The first was Gnosticism, which is, um, Gnosticism just teaches that there's a secret knowledge out there and you have to have the secret knowledge to really know who God is. That's Gnosticism, really simplified. But we have that around today, right? That spirituality is based by this secret knowledge. And I am a better Christian because I've read this book or gone to this seminar or have this knowledge that the rest of you don't have, you poor simpletons. That that's, the Gnosticism was the thing back there, but, but we have our own versions today. And anything that does not unite the church and draw you to love your brothers and sisters in the Lord more, you need to beware of. 
And so there, there's Gnosticism. I think we have modern forms of our own Gnosticism. Another would be Judaizers, and they were ones that taught that to be a Christian, you had to keep all of the Jewish laws and traditions. If you wanted to be a true Christian, you had to do that. And we have a lot of versions of that where spirituality is judged by what you do or what you don't do. We tend to just call that legalism. But unfortunately, legalism isn't, is, is sometimes taken to the extreme where it becomes just a false religion and a false teaching. So we need to beware of that. Peter doesn't identify the specific heresy here, but he does warn that they will go so far even denying the master who bought them. He says, you know, sometimes these, these, these false teachers will go, go so far even to deny Jesus Christ. It could take many, many forms. We don't know what the false teachers were saying. We know, going back to chapter 1, verse 16, that they were saying that Peter was um, probably just making up myths, that he was, that's what they were, you know, Peter's just telling you lies. He's making stuff up. Those are fairy tales. Listen to, to our way of going. It could be that they were twisting the gospel in some way. And really, that's the one that, that scares me the most is where people take the gospel and there's enough gospel in it, but they twist it just enough to make it wrong. But it sounds good. I want to give you a, a, a very real example of that. Um, this is from an article entitled God Equals Love. Um, and the, the author goes through what he learned the gospel to be and he, he bullet points it. And it's actually just a really good understanding of the gospel and then he says this, what if I learned it all wrong though? What if this is actually the gospel? God really, really loves us a lot. He wants us to love him, love living on the earth he created, and love being in relationship with each other. He's been trying since the Garden of Eden to show us how much he loves us. He's kind, he's kind of like the boy that has a cr crazy crush on a girl and just wants to be in a relationship with her. Our human slogan has been, I did it my way. So each time God tries to have a relationship with us, we screw it up and demand that God give us a list of rules to follow instead of engaging with Him in relationship. We also screw up our relationships with each other because we are, set, we are each demanding our own way. Since we asked for a list of rules, God in His justice had to provide consequences when we broke the rules that we asked Him to give us. However, this was never His heart or goal. After trying various other ways to show us how much He loved us and wants a relationship with us, God sent His Son, Jesus, to show and tell us in person how much He loved us. However, this so offended the religious leaders that instead of changing their understanding of God, they decided to kill His Son. However, because God is all about life and because Jesus is God, God raised him back from the dead. This encounter with the crucifixion and resurrection proved that God was more powerful than anything, that he was so in love with humanity that he was willing to endure the absolute worst that humanity could inflict if it would convince some of us that he loved us and offering the only path to cheat death. That is what some people are saying is the gospel. And it, there, there's nice language in there, right? He's talking about Jesus and he's talking about love, but there's so much wrong in there. One of the things that's wrong is humans are defining God's motives and truths rather than Scripture defining God's motives and truths. Because what he, what he presented in the first part of the article was Scripture. It was the gospel as understood from Scripture. He's like, but what if that's wrong? What if it's really this? We are not in the place to judge whether the way God has revealed himself is right or wrong. God has revealed what is true. And so you have in this form humans judging the heart and goals of God. One of the other things that, that is wrong there is God's holiness, holiness is diminished and the severity of sin is removed. I mean, did you... Did you catch how not, not a big deal 
sin is in this is that God loves us so much and we asked him for laws and we broke those laws, but God, no. Sin is rebellion against a holy God that created us. It's, It's rebellion. And it diminishes that. It diminishes God's God's holiness, the fact that he is altogether different than us, he is not like us. And it diminishes the severity of our sin. And when you diminish the severity of our sin, you really diminish the, the glory and the majesty of the cross, right? It's really just not a big deal that we sinned. So really, Jesus didn't pay much, didn't pay for much on the cross, just that little, you know, not big deal of our sin, well, no, our sin was a big deal. It's rebellion against God and Jesus Christ. And we sinned against an infinite God, and our sin is, is infinite, and Jesus' grace is infinite. I like, like the song we sang last week, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. If you diminish what sin is, you diminish the gift of God. And another thing that's wrong with this is it moves humans to the center of God's worship. It really, as you read that, you have God worshiping mankind not the other way around, and it removes the glory of the atonement. These types of teachings destroy a church. They destroy the gospel. You end up with with gospel light or no gospel at all because you end up with with a human-based, human-centered approach. And these false teachings are dangerous because they, they will destroy a church. And dis- false teachings split churches. The gospel unifies churches. That's one of the things we look for. And so we see that the gospel is brought in, the, or false teaching is brought in through, through these secret destructive heresies. And we need to be aware of that, and we just need to be um, on guard against that. Again, when something sounds weird... Go back and test it. Ask questions of other Christians. So we saw that. Now let's look at the destruction of false teachers. The destruction of false teachers, the end of the verse there. It says that even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So Peter uses a little bit of clever language here. He says they're bringing in destructive heresies that bring upon them destruction. So they bring in destructive heresies, and destruction is brought on them. The idea is is that destruction is imminent. It may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but it is hanging over their head. It is going to happen for sure, and they will be judged, and when they are judged, it will be quick. Now go to John chapter 3. Look at John chapter 3, 16. I want you to see the idea of imminent destruction. Um, we go to John 3.16 as one of the most uh, beautiful verses in the Bible. Uh, you see it at football games. You see it all over the place. Talking about God's love for the world, right? But as you read down, you also see that there's judgment. There's a reason we need to be saved because God is going to judge sin. So look at what he says here. This is Jesus talking, John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So we we love that. Verse 16, God loved the world so much that he sent his Son. And verse 17, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He just came to save them. Well, why didn't Jesus come to condemn the world? Look at verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So the reason Jesus didn't need to come to condemn the world is the world's already under condemnation. The condemnation is there. The wages of sin is death. It's there. And so verse 16 is, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 16 is just saying, the gift has arrived The gift that God promised back in Genesis 3.15 that one would come and crush Satan and that there would be a a seed of Adam and Eve that would come and save the people, 
It's here with Jesus. God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Again, that's imminent destruction, right? Condemnation is on the world. Judgment is coming. We sang that song, Jesus Christ, our hope in life and death. And if you haven't put your hope in life and death in Jesus Christ, destruction is imminent. Well, how, how are you saved from that? How do you escape the, the condemnation? Look at verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. How do you escape the condemnation? You come to the light. What is the light? It's the good news of verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever does what is true comes to the light. And so that's why when we talk about you know, how do you become a Christian, when we talk about repentance, turning from sin. But it's not just turning from sin, it's turning from sin and grabbing a hold of Jesus Christ as your only hope in life and death. It's going from worshiping self and idols and your own passions and desires to saying, I'm going to worship Jesus Christ because he died on a cross for my sins and he is awesome. He is what's best. He is the great. He will satisfy all of my needs. He is sufficient for everything. I will hold on to Jesus Christ like a drowning man in the ocean hanging on to a life preserver. He's my only hope. That's where salvation comes. That's what it means to put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not just go, yeah, you know, I'm a sinner and I know he died a while ago and then live your own life. It's say, I know I'm a sinner and I know Jesus Christ died on my sins and my only hope is to hold tight to him as, to hold to him as tightly as I can. That's the gospel. And so when Peter talks here about this imminent destruction, this destruction that's coming on them, he's talking about that imminent destruction. False teachers are going to rise, but don't fall in with them. Don't fall for their lies because they will face final judgment. And don't let the presence of false teachers terrify you. Like, don't become so afraid of false teachers that you're having a conversation with someone and they say something that's you know maybe a little bit off and you're like false teacher you know have conversations talk about the gospel we, we work out our faith with fear and trembling right but but work it out go to scripture i i think i accidentally um i know i I'm, i taught bible at hawaii baptist academy um in hawaii for a few years is before i went to seminary it was before I knew what modalism is. And most of you are like, what is modalism? It's, it's a heresy about the Trinity. I think I accidentally taught it in a class. <laughs> and, and I remember I, I had, we were talking about the Trinity, so you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so, what, so I wrote on the board, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I said, God interacts with us some way. So some times he interacts with us as the Father and, you know, sometimes he switches, you know, sometimes the son saves us and he interacts this way and, you know, he interacts in this life with the Holy Spirit. And I was trying to get them to understand that they were, um, that the Holy, that the Trinity is a part of our life every time. But afterwards, one of the girls came up and she said, so sometimes God's the Father, sometimes he's the Son, sometimes he's the Trinity. It's like, no, no, that, okay, that wasn't understood. That, that's actually modalism. That's a heresy. Don't, <clears throat> so give grace, Okay. Because sometimes as, as we work through things, you have to go, you read, a cha- you read a chapter, you read a verse in the Bible, and you're like, oh, this. And then you have to go, oh, wait, this. I didn't read that verse over there. So don't, don't become so afraid of false teachers that you run around accusing everybody in the church. Be gracious, grow with one another, learn with one another, but be aware of movements, Right? Be aware of movements where whole groups of people are becoming 
modern-day Gnostics. We have this truth that you don't have, and therefore we're better Christians. Or you're not a Christian because you do this or you don't do this, and you need to come be like us. Beware of that kind of thing. So, back on track. The false teachers, the, the destruction is, is imminent. It, it's hanging over them. But what is the character of false teachers? Look at verses 2 and 3. Peter gives us some ideas of the things that he was seeing and, and the things that he saw. So these false teachers are going to come, but what are they like? He says in verse 2, And many of them will follow their sensuality. And so you have this, this sensuality. The NIV uh, translates that their deprived conduct. Holman Standard Bible translates it their unrestrained, unrestrained ways. And so you get this picture of sensuality is this immorality, this um, extreme immorality is what's in view. That that's what they are. Um, I know of a church uh, in my hometown when I was in high school that um, the immorality in the leadership was so bad, and I learned this later um, as friends kind of married in there, and I heard the stories of what was happening, that I don't even think you could call it a church. It, it, was, it was a place of false teaching, and they were twisting and manipulating to control people and, and really exist in extreme immorality. It was just, I was shocked at what I was told. False teachers can be depraved in their conduct. They, they, will, they can be sensual. They can push you to... Um, immorality. If somebody is pushing you to immorality, run from them as quickly as you can. Another uh, characteristic is that they are blasphemers. It says the way of truth will be blasphemed. And blasphemy is to slander God's name. And what Peter is saying here is by their actions, they blaspheme, who they slander God's name. They destroy the beauty and the majesty of who he is. The next thing on the list is greed. False teachers may be in it for the money. It says in verse 3, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Everything is done for the goal of making money. It was bad in Jeremiah's day. Listen to this, Jeremiah 6.13. It says, from, For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from the prophet to the priest, everyone deals falsely. False teachers can deal dishonestly to make money. God told me I need a new jet, so could you guys send more money in? <laughs> they can be exploiters. Matthew 7, 15, Jesus described them as ravenous wolves, remember? Ravenous wolves. A ravenous wolf is ruled by his appetite. And, and that... that that appetite just consumes them, and they only chase after that. A false teacher will use and manipulate people to feed their greed. False teachers will exploit you to feed their greed and their sensuality, and in doing so, they will blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. Let's look at those same verses, though, and now think about you and false teachers you and false teachers. Let's, let's look and think about this instead of them. That's what they are, but what do we need to be aware of? How do, how do we respond to this? I would, I would encourage you to use the pronoun me as we go through this. How would this affect me? How would I deal with this? Because here's the fact, sensuality will attract some of us. I say us because we're in this together and none of us is above getting sucked in. As I studied this week and the examples of false teachers, I, I kept you know, just thinking of these things. And, and I think of, um, I, there's a pastor's conference I, I go to occasionally and um, see a lot of people that I went to college with. And um, about 10 years ago, I almost, I, told, I came back for, told to me, I said, I don't know that I'm going to go anymore. Because it seems like every year I go, I learn of a friend from college that's fallen into sin, that's fallen into immorality. And it's heartbreaking and as I thought about this, and you think about this, that, you know, he says, and many will follow their sensuality. He's talking about people in the church following after their sensuality. And so as we read this, we don't want to go, 
well, that's, those false teachers are horrible and there's people in those other churches that will fall for us. No, there are people in this church that will fall for that. And as we think about this thing, we need to be praying, yea, but for the grace of God go I. And, and don't become so proud that we don't think that this is something that we can fall into. I remember having a young man come to me and confess that um, he had had an inappropriate relationship with his girlfriend. And he's just being honest. He's like, I, I mean, just, just in humility, broken. And he said, you know, a month ago, he goes, I remember a month ago, I was praying to God and I was like, just thinking, you know, I am at this university and I am learning about God and I have Christian roommates. I have arrived spiritually and just kind of thinking that sin was beyond him. A month later, he ended up where he never thought he would be. Yea, but for the grace of God, go I. We live in a sensual culture. We live in a culture that immorality is being presented as normal and is being celebrated, and we cannot fall for it. And then the next thing I would remind or look at as we think about ourselves is we want to beware that we don't fall for that. And then it says, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. It says, and many will fall for their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Who's the them talking about there? Is it talking about the false teachers? Or is it talking about the people that fell for the sensuality? I can go either way. It's true, right? Either way is true. It terrifies me to think that the way of God would be blasphemed because of my actions. Look over at Romans chapter 2. I I think these are some of the scariest verses in the Bible um, as I think about myself and, and my walk with the Lord. In verse 24 is the, is the scary verse. It says, For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Let me read the entire paragraph. It says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know His will and approve what is excellent... So take out the word Jew there and insert the word Christian. If you call yourself a Christian and rely on the law, rely on God's grace, and boast in God and know His will and approve He is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others Do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. I mean, you can look at that and go, well, that's talking about pastors. No, that's talking about Christians. If we as Christians live in a world and we try to teach other people the gospel and we say, you know, don't steal, do we steal? And we say to people, don't commit adultery, but we're committing adultery and we're saying, don't idol, don't make idols out of things, but we're making idols out of things. People are going to look at us and laugh and God's name becomes blasphemed. Back in, in... 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter talks about his voice was borne by him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we get this amazing, gorgeous, beautiful picture of who God is. And you just think about this, this gorgeous painting of the majesty of God. And the, then we in our sin come and we just paint ugly graffiti across it. And people laugh at God because of us. It's terrifying to think that the name of God would be blasphemed because of me. And I hope that it's terrifying to you that the name of God would be blasphemed because of you. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. God's name will be blasphemed because of us. We'll we'll yell at our kids. We'll... um, I remember getting a little too upset with a referee at a soccer game. 
That was like 10 years ago. Um, but, but then really having to wrestle through that, like, they know I'm a Christian. And so what do we do? Don't cower. Run and grab a hold of Jesus Christ. Our sins, there are many. His mercy is more. But I, I hope there is that rational fear of, I don't want to slander and revile God's name. And when I do, I'm going to the people that I offended. I'm going to go, hey, listen, think poorly of me, but don't think poorly of my God because he saved lousy people like me, all right? Another cost. So we don't want to fall for the sensuality. We don't want the name of God blasphemed. We don't want to be, we don't want to get beat up and exploited by their greed and and false words. And and here's the thing, is if you fall for false teachers, you will get beat up you will get exploited. You'll be exploited spiritually, emotionally, financially, physically, and and all of these things have happened in churches. Run from false teachers. Run from people that will exploit you. Follow people who make much of Christ and not themselves. Follow people who lift God's name high, not their own. Follow people who point you to the Bible, not their wisdom. Follow who people who make you dependent on Jesus Christ, not on them. But mostly, follow God and not people. Spend time in His Word so that your faith is built on the precious and very great promises that He told us about in chapter 1. As we think about false teachers, we always have to think about ourselves and not make this an us them thing we guard ourselves against them but we're always thinking yea but for the grace of god go i finally let's talk about the justice of god at the end of verse three it says their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep god's justice isn't asleep he he didn't forget Scoffers will come and say that Jesus didn't forget over in um, chapter 3, verse 3. It says, know this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. I think they'll come and they'll say, when's Jesus coming back? You say he's coming back. He's not coming back. And part of that is he's not going to judge me. Well, he is. Our actions have consequences. They have consequences. The false prophets who arose among the people, they all face condemnation in the Old Testament. You can go and you can can read the stories where God judges. But sometimes He doesn't in this world. Sometimes it's not visible to us. The false teachers of, of Peter's day faced condemnation. We don't know how. Or why? We don't know that they ever faced condemnation in this world, but one day they died and they stood before God. And the condemnation that was on them came. And it's hard when you have friends and family members that that fall for false teaching. When we were in Hawaii working with the college students there, we had a young lady that was deceived and um, sucked into a cult. And there's not, it's just what happened. And her parents were hurt. They were angry. They were frustrated. They pray, well, will God save our daughter from these people? How could God let our daughter fall into this? Will those people face the condemnation they deserve? Eventually, we live in a fallen, evil world, and we don't always get to see justice on this side of glory. But God's judgment is not idle. It's not asleep. And so as we think about false teachers, again, we want to be on guard, but we don't want to be terrified into immobility. We don't want to be terrified into inaction. Know that, yeah, false teachers are going to come. It's our job to guard against them. And next week, we're, we're going to look at this more as we try to do the rest of the chapter. Um, but here's, here's the takeaway for this morning, okay? Number one, beware of false teachers. 
Guard your heart and your mind. Beware of what you're reading, what you're watching, what you're listening to. Guard the gospel. That would be the second thing is guard the gospel. Be discerning. Check on what it is that you're watching and listening to, but work to maintain a high view of who God is. As soon as you're reading something that's beginning to make God seem more like us, that should cause you to pause and maintain a high view of who God is in, in His holiness. And the main thing is, live out what Peter described in the first chapter. So I'm going to conclude with this. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 11. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we strive for, right? Entrance into God's kingdom. An entrance into God's kingdom doesn't come by making every effort to do those things. We make every effort to do those things because God has given us entrance into his kingdom. That he, verses 3 and 4, because he has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. We stand on that truth. God has given us His precious and very great promises in Jesus Christ. There's going to be false teachers, but we don't need to be terrified of them or fear them as long as we stand on who Jesus Christ is. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your precious and great promises. God, we thank You that You have given us everything we need for life and godliness. God, we thank you for your word that tells us what we need to know to be saved. It tells us what we need to know to live godly lives. God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer, Lord, and that you give us the help we need. God, you give us the strength we need. God, we don't have to rely on our own willpower to be godly, Lord. We stand in the might of your strength. So God, we pray that we would be a people that leans heavily on you. God, that we would remember that we're dependent on you. And Lord, as we live in this world where there are so many false messages, so many voices speaking into our lives, God, we pray that through your word, through the Holy Spirit, that you would guard us, that we would be on guard, Lord, that we would be able to identify what is true and what is false. And Lord, ultimately, that we would hold tight to what is true. Lord, we want to reflect your glory and your majesty, your goodness. We don't want to blaspheme your name. We want to hold your name high. Lord, help us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. Um, I'll be here at the front with a couple of other people. If you'd like to pray about something, uh, we would love to pray with you. Um, But more importantly, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, if you've not grabbed a hold of him as your only hope in life and death, One of us would love to talk with you or sit and talk with God right now or talk with somebody that's here, but don't leave here without knowing for sure what your hope is in life and death. All right? Let's sing together. Would you guys stand as we sing?
Well, I'll make the announcements quick so you don't even have to sit. Um, just want to say, if you're new with us this morning, um, please visit the welcome counter. We have a, a gift for you. And also, be sure to fill out your connection cards. And those who are not new, uh, fill out your connection cards as well with any prayer requests you might have. Uh, that's it. And thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Uh, you guys have a great week. One, two, three.